This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. What is going on and welcome to Take On The World Lockup. In the rugged remote corner of Crescent City, nestled several miles north of the bustling urban center, and just a stone throws away from the Oregon border, lies Pelican Bay State Prison. The prison. It's a formidable establishment, born in 1989, spanning an impressive 275 acres of land. But what truly sets it apart is its layout and operation. Picture this. An imposing X-shaped array of buildings dominates a quarter of the prison's vast expanse. This is the Security Housing Unit, better known as the SHU, or SHU. Within its confines, there are 1,056 solitary confinement cells, neatly organized into 132 clusters of eight cells each. Each of these cells, measuring a modest 8 feet by 10 feet, boasts minimal furnishings, a concrete ledge doubling as a bed, with a foam pad for comfort, a combination sink toilet made of stainless steel, and two concrete cubes serving as a desk and a chair. The atmosphere is stark, utilitarian, and unforgiving. Guarded vigilantly by armed personnel, six pods of 48 cells each are meticulously monitored from a central control booth. The cell doors operated remotely remain under strict authority. Though prisoners are granted grief reprieves for showers and solitary confinement in an 8 by 20 foot outdoor yard, their vision is often obscured by perforated steel doors, offering guards a watchful advantage. But Pelican Bay is more than just its SHU. Half of the prison caters to level 4 inmates, the highest security classification, who reside in a general population setting, housed in two-man cells. The rest of the complex is a tapestry of security levels, with level two inmates occupying an open cell dormitory style arrangement, while level one prisoners, deemed minimum security, find themselves in a facility outside the main perimeter. As of March 2022, Pelican Bay was the home of 1,852 individuals, each navigating their own journey within its walls. Among them, 1,112 were classified as level four inmates, with 290 confined within the confines of the security housing unit. It's a microcosm of society, where lives intersect against the backdrop of concrete and steel, where time seems both eternal and fleeting. Pelican Bay State Prison stands as a testament to the complex and often contentious nature of the penal system, a world unto itself in the heart of California's rugged landscape. The History In the wake of its establishment in 1989, Pelican Bay State Prison bore witness to a darker side of the penal system, where a culture of violence festered within its walls. Guards, eager to assert dominance, unleashed a reign of brutality upon the inmates, particularly those confined to the security housing unit. Within the confines of the SHU, inmates endured unimaginable horrors, beatings, forced nudity, and a sinister spectacle of staged gladiator fights, something you only thought you would see in a movie. The walls of Pelican Bay echoed with the cries of those subjected to this twisted form of entertainment. One haunting episode involved Vaughn Dortch, a man serving 10-year sentence for grand theft. Plagued by worsening mental health illness exacerbated by his time in the SHU, Dortch became a victim of the guard's unchecked aggression. In April 1992, after smearing himself with feces, Dortch was taken by the guards for a bath. Instead of care, he was met with cruelty. Five or six guards bathed him in scalding water while he was handcuffed, leaving him with second and third degree burns, a stark testament to the inhumanity within those prison walls. The SHU, grappling with overcrowding issues, saw prisoners housed two to a cell. By 1990, 364 inmates were double bunked, and that number skyrocketed to approximately 1,000 by 1995. The result was a breeding ground for violence, with serious injuries stemming from cell fights becoming a grim reality. Public outrage reached a tipping point, fueled by the media's exposure. 
a September 1993 60 Minutes report laid bare the brutality suffered by Vaughn Dortch, and the legal battles ensued. In the landmark 1995 Madrid versus Gomez decision, federal district court judge Felton Henderson declared Pelican Bay State Prison operation unconstitutional. Henderson mandated oversight by prisoners' rights lawyers and other experts, specifically demanding changes to curb excessive force by guards, rectify inadequate medical and mental health care, and put an end to the practice of housing mentally ill prisoners in the SHU. Pelican Bay, once shrouded in the shadows of unchecked aggression, was forced to confront its own demons. The legal intervention marked a turning point, ushering in a new era where accountability and humane treatment became imperative within the formidable walls of this California institution. The hunger strikes. Within the cold, imposing walls of Pelican Bay State Prison, a silent protest echoed through the cells, carried on by the fragile shoulders of inmates who had endured years of isolation. The practice of subjecting prisoners to prolonged periods in a security housing unit had ignited a spark of resistance. In 2002, the first whispers of dissent emerged as 60 SHU inmates embarked on a hunger strike, a desperate plea to draw attention to the harsh realities of isolation. Their voices reverberated through the prison, highlighting the toll taken by the secure housing unit's oppressive conditions. The rumblings of discontent reached a crescendo on July 1, 2011, as several thousand prisoners at Pelican Bay State Prison joined forces with over 6,000 inmates across California. Together, they staged a hunger strike, a collective outcry against overly restrictive conditions and extended periods of isolation. Their demands were basic yet essential. Warm clothing, a handball for their scant one-hour outdoor activity, the ability to make a weekly phone call, adequate food, and a chance to reconsider their prolonged isolation after several years. This initial strike endured for over two weeks, leaving an indelible mark on the collective consciousness of the prison. The protest echoes resonated once more in October the same year, underscoring the persistent grievance that fueled inmates' determination. In 2013, the discontent flared up again on July 8th, with inmates alleging that California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation's failure to uphold its promise made in the aftermath of previous strikes. This time, the hunger strike swelled to include a staggering 29,000 prisoners across California. Their demands went beyond the confines of Pelican Bay, addressing the cruel policies used to identify and isolate alleged gang members, challenging lengthy, solitary confinement, and advocating for improved living conditions. The strike endured a grueling two months, and the toll on the participants was visible as dozens were hospitalized. The prolonged protest cast a spotlight on security housing units, revealing a magnitude of prisoners enduring such conditions and a staggering fact that some had languished in solitary confinement at Pelican Bay for two decades. As the seventh week of strike unfolded, Judge Thelton Henderson intervened, signing an order allowing the refeeding of participating prisoners. Although the specifics of the order were unclear, it became a mute point when Senator Lonnie Hancock and Assembly Member Tom Amiano pledged to investigate the state's policy on solitary confinement and consider legislative changes. Encouraged by this promise, prisoners agreed to end their hunger strike, marking a pivotal moment in the ongoing struggle for humane conditions within the walls of Pelican Bay State Prison. Notable Inmates The storied halls of Pelican Bay State Prison have housed a diverse array of individuals, each with their own chapter and a complex narrative of California's penal system. Among them, a cast of characters whose notoriety extends far beyond the prison walls. In Annals of Pelican Bay, the name Hugo Pennell stands the testament to enduring confinement. Infamous for the 1971 San Quentin escape attempt that left six dead, Pennell spent an anguishing 43 years in long-term confinement, with 23 of those served in an unforgiving security housing unit. His release into general population was tragically short-lived, as he met a violent end in a riot at California State Prison, Sacramento just two weeks later. Brian Oliver, the Taft Union high school shooter, found himself within Pelican Bay's confines, serving 27 years and four months sentence for attempted murder and assault with a deadly weapon. A stark reminder of the crimes committed in a moment of profound despair. Then there was Joe Pegleg Morgan, a name etched in history as the first non-Hispanic Mexican mafia member, serving a life sentence 
for a 1956 murder. Morgan's journey took him from the SHU to the hospital ward of Cochrane State Prison, where he succumbed to liver cancer in November of 1993. Seneca Secure, a former Crips member turned author, faced five years in SHU for assault and grand theft auto in 1991. His path, marked by parole violations, ultimately led to his release in August 2012. Rene Enriquez, once a member of the Mexican Mafia, witnessed a dramatic shift from the SHU to protective custody at Ironwood State Prison after becoming a federal informant. His story unfolded against the backdrop of the criminal underworld. Arturo Castellanos, member of the Florescina 13 Street Gang and a high-ranking Mexican Mafia member, orchestrated not only gang activities, but also played a role in the 2013 hunger strike within the SHU. The roster continues with Robert Walter Scully, an Aryan Brotherhood member whose crimes extend beyond the prison walls, and Mark William Cunningham, a serial killer whose deeds in 1983 stained his name in infamy. This list includes familiar faces like actor Lloyd Avery II, who's known for his role in Boys in the Hood, who met a tragic end within the prison system, and Marion Suge Knight, a record producer whose life took a detour through Pelican State on charges of parole violation and assault. Even infamous cult leader Charles Manson made a brief appearance, serving time at Pelican Bay's SHU before we moved back to California State Prison Cochrane. In this mosaic of lives, from murderers to actors, Pelican Bay State Prison became more than just a correctional facility. It became a stage where stories of redemption, violence, and notoriety unfolded behind bars. Each inmate etching a unique chapter in the complex and often troubled history of this formidable institution. The conclusion. The saga of Pelican Bay State Prison, with its complex tapestry of brutality, legal battles, hunger strikes, and the notable individuals who walked its corridors, stands as a testament to the intricate nature of the penal system. From the stark confines of the security housing unit, where Von Dorch's harrowing ordeals shed light on the darkness within, to the collective voices of the inmates rising in hunger strikes against prolonged isolation, in the prison's history, is marked by both shadows and glimmers of change. Notable inmates like Hugo Pinnell, whose confinement spanned decades, and Arturo Castellanos, a gang member involved in the 2013 hunger strike, further underscored diverse stories that unfolded within those formidable walls. As we reflect on Pelican Bay's chapters, we are reminded of the resilience, struggles, and at times the failures of the system that shaped the lives within. Pelican Bay State Prison remains a microcosm of society's complexities, where the fight for justice and humane treatment echoes through its history. We took on the Pelican Bay State Prison. Now you go take on the world, but don't get locked up doing it. Bacon is my podcast. Need I say more? Bacon makes everything better. So this must be a good podcast. The musicians who get together, hang out, drink some whiskey, sometimes invite some guests on, and uh, just have a good time. This is a recipe for fun, entertaining, unique podcast released two times a week. Make sure you check out Bacon is my podcast. Because bacon makes everything better. Beard Laws Podcast. Imagine a bunch of friends sitting in their favorite dive bar chatting about whatever pops into their mind. Sometimes it's serious, sometimes it's heated, but every time it's fun and you will laugh at least once during the show. We follow the same bar rules. We never talk politics, religion, or race. So make sure you check out Beard Laws Podcast. The Deluxe Edition Network, also known as The Den, is an incredible podcast network that offers a wide variety of entertaining and informative podcasts. With a lineup of shows covering various topics, such as interviews with a wide variety of guests, history, music, relationships, true crime, and so much more. The Den provides content that caters to a diverse range of interests. The hosts and guests on the Deluxe Edition Network demonstrate a deep passion and expertise in their respective fields, making each episode on each show engaging and thought-provoking. The network fosters a sense of community by encouraging listeners to interact through live chats, social media, and forums, creating an inclusive environment for discussion and sharing opinions. With its commitment to high-quality production, the shows in the Deluxe Edition Network continue to captivate and entertain its ever-growing audience. Whether you're a podcast enthusiast or someone looking to explore new topics, 
The Den is a fantastic platform to dive into and uncover fascinating insights from experts in their fields. The Deluxe Edition Network is the home of independent awesomeness. To find all these great podcasts in one convenient location, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com.